All right, so I have posted a lecture from a different instructor from a different university or a different um, college that <clears throat> spoke about Chapter 5 um, in the OpenStax text. Um, I think she did a really great job. She had embedded videos and things like that, so I have had you um, watch that for part of your lecture notes. Um, however, I do think she did miss some key things from the text that are um, that you should know. So I'm going to do this video on Chapter 5, and this is going to be just kind of filling in some of the gaps that that instructor um, did not talk about from the text. So make sure that you have watched the previous lecture um, by the other instructor and you have taken notes on that. And then uh, make sure that you take notes on this so that you kind of have the complete picture. Um, so here we are in chapter five. Uh, we're talking about, or we're looking at our eukaryotic microorganisms. Um, so eukaryotic microorganisms. And with eukaryotic microorganisms, I think she did a great job of kind of doing an introduction to eukaryotic microorganisms. And basically, um, really she kind of jumped into the protozoa. So recall that the protozoa are actually part of the protists group. And so she is starting with the protists um, as the text does, and then kind of jumps right into the protozoa. But she does kind of skip over a couple of protists that they mentioned that I feel like is an important thing to mention, just because we hear a lot about them. And that's plankton. Um, and plankton we may hear from different ocean organisms that um, eat plankton and live off of plankton, and then of course larger organisms eat those organisms, etc. Um, so I just wanted to make mention that plankton are microbes that drift in the water, uh, drift or float in water. And so then there are two mentioned in the text. There's zooplankton, and then there was phytoplankton. And the zooplankton are motile and non-photosynthetic. And then the phytoplankton, of course, are then not motile um, and are photosynthetic. And the reason that I want to mention these, zooplankton are kind of the plankton that uh, we think of that look like little tiny shrimp, for example, like very, very tiny shrimp that are kind of crawling around in the ocean or swimming around in the ocean. Um, but then phytoplankton are more like um, basically immobile bacteria, kind of chunks of cells uh, floating around that are photosynthetic. So uh, those are just a couple of terms that I wanted to mention there that are protists, um, but not protozoa. And then she went into talking about different protozoa. Um, and so then she went through kind of that protozoa are aquatic and terrestrial and free living and parasitic uh, and heterotrophic. Um, that remember that um, protists are kind of this catch-all group that um, if they don't fit somewhere else, they end up being a protist. Um, so then in protozoas, we see a lot of diversity in protozoa. Um, she did mention things like trophozoites, so you should know the different stages that she mentioned. Um, so the different terms, she, she did go through um, some of the organelles or some of the different types of parts of the protozoa. Um, so you should know those different parts of the protozoa that she mentioned, you know, things like the plasma lemma, the pellicle, the ectoplasm and endoplasm and uh, cytosome and cytoproct and all of those things that you should be familiar with, the contractile vacuoles and things like that. Um, you should be familiar with as well. Um, and she did talk a bit about the um, cycle, the life cycle of a protozoa. So you should be familiar with things like trophozoites and a cyst and an encapsulated cyst and what encystment is or excystment. Um, so you should be familiar with all of those different things that she did go through um, with images as well. Um, one thing that she did not mention, however, is the taxonomy of protists. So taxonomy of protists. And I just want to mention this briefly, the taxonomy of protists, um, because then it kind of is a little bit more clear about why she moves through the different groups. Um, so first, the protists are what are called polyphyletic. 
Oops, polyphyletic. Yep. So polyphyletic, um, and polyphyletic meaning that they don't have this evolutionary origin, this shared evolutionary origin. Um, so things kind of, again, they're kind of coming from all over the place um, with their evolution. So uh, it's based on evolutionary history, and then it's it's kind of across all these different taxonomic groups, uh, but it's all part of eukaryotes. <clears throat> so um, they, we can write that down, lack shared evolutionary origin and scattered across many eukaryotic groupings. So then there are six supergroups you should be familiar with. So the first one, and she talks a bit about these, um, are amoebozoa. And amoebozoa have lots of clinical significant uh, protozoa, which is why it's talked about more in the text and in also in her lecture. Um, the second one is excavata. And again, it, it has some clinical significance um, and is talked about more in the text and her lecture. And same thing with chrome alveolata. Uh, chrome alveolata. Uh, so again, same thing with that one. The three that are not mentioned as much in the text and therefore not mentioned much in her lecture are Apisthocanta. And Apisthocanta um, are some protozoa, but there aren't any clinically significant protozoa there. Um, this does, however, include animals and fungi. So this is one of the supergroups of protists that includes those. Uh, another one is Rhizeria. And Rhizeria has, again, some protozoa, but they're not significantly, uh, clinically significant protozoa. And then the last one is Archaeplastida. And with the Archaeplastida, they, uh, this group actually has some algae in it, and that will be discussed um, throughout the text as well in, in her lecture. So then she did start talking about the Amoebozoa, and did speak a bit about um, amoebozoa specifically and some other um, organisms related to or within the group amoebozoa. Um, so you should be familiar with uh, Entamoeba histolytica, for example, or uh, Nagleria fowleri, um, and other ones as we are moving and as you are moving through Chapter 5, um, it is good for you to read the text and learn about these different organisms, um, but the organisms that you should focus the most on are those that are in the Chapter 5 eukaryotic organisms activity that we'll be doing or assignment that we'll be doing. Um, and those are the ones that you should know more details on and that you should prepare in more detail uh, for the quiz and, and also for the exam. So she did speak about a couple of amoebozoa, but what she also missed here, and it was mentioned briefly in her text, but are the slime molds. Um, so you might see tozoa. <laughs> and uh, the slime molds are within this amoebozoa. So these are the slime molds, which is different than the fungi molds. Um, so that's why they have slime in front of them, so slime molds. Um, and there are two different types of slime molds that you should be familiar with. The first are the cellular slime molds. And the cellular slime molds are individual amoeboid cells, um, but then they periodically are going to assemble into what's called a slug. Once it assembles into the slug, then it's mobile. Um, so then it can move and it can kind of spread out and move to other areas where maybe there are more nutrients um, or something in particular. And then that slug is going to form into what's called a fruiting body and haploid spores. Um, and that's what's going to allow that slug uh, to then create more of this slime mold. So there is a... Um, an image in your text of this process here. It's a bit complex, 
Um, but if we start with these uh, fruiting bodies, because then we end up again at the fruiting bodies, um, we kind of see their life cycle as these uh, fruiting bodies. And then these fruiting bodies generate uh, spores. So then these spores are generated in these fruiting bodies. This is via meiosis. And then these fruiting bodies are mature. So they mature. And then after they mature, they release those spores. And then once they release the spores, the spores are going to germinate. And then that germination is what gives rise to that individual amoeboid cell. So amoeboid, wow. amoeboid <clears throat> cells. Um, so then that germination provides that amoeboid, and then that can divide, and then it forms more cells. And then these more cells um, can then come together, they fuse, and they form a zygote. <clears throat> and then once that um, aggregates with others, so, so that um, amoeboid cell here can fuse with another to form a zygote and then it can go through the process of meiosis and make more amoeboids um, and then once there are lots of these amoeboids then they can come together into something called a slug um, so uh, we'll say aggregate into a slug um, and then remember that this slug is mobile and then this slug can then move um, via, you know, because it's mobile. And then as it moves, it finds this new place to go. So it can kind of spread out more, finds this new place to, to go. And then again, it goes through the next part of the cycle, which is they stop. Then this aggregate is going to form a fruiting body. And then that fruiting body is going to go through meiosis, create these spores, and then the whole process starts over again. Um, so that is an example, or that is the life cycle of one type of slime mold. That's the cellular slime mold. The second slime mold is the plasmodial slime mold. And with our plasmodial slime mold, these are large multinucleate amoeboid cells. Um, and then these form what are called reproductive stalks. And then those are what are going to produce spores and then produce gametes. So kind of similar, um, I didn't draw a picture up here, but here are the fruiting bodies for the cellular slime molds that then will produce spores inside of the fruiting bodies here. Um, then when they mature, they kind of burst open. When they burst open, they're going to release those spores to the exterior. Then the spores are going to germinate. I'm just drawing them as larger ones. Uh, then they end up being an amoeboid kind of cell with the pseudopods there. And then they come together with other amoeboid cells and then form this slug that can then move along. And then it's going to go back and produce these stalks with these spores in them. Now the plasmodial slime mold, which we had just moved into, um, also has kind of this stalk structure, but with this stalk structure, it's called a sporangia. Uh, so we kind of have this start and then this stalk structure here, which is the sporangia. Then the sporangia is going to go through meiosis and it's going to create these spores inside here, very, very similar. <clears throat> create the spores, then the spores are going to burst out. Once the spores burst out, so spores, um, once those burst out, that that's that mature sporangia is going to release those spores. The spores are going to germinate, kind of similar to the other one. Um, once they germinate, then those cells can go between either an amoeboid stage or a flagellated form. Um, so as amoeboid cells, so we can either become amoeboid uh, with my strangely drawn amoeboid 
with kind of the pseudopods there. That's what those lines are, or those squiggly marks are supposed to be. Um, we have our amoeboid version. So our amoeboid cells. And then we also, this, um, when it germina uh, germinates, it can turn into either the amoeboid cell or the flagellated cell. Um, so one that has a flagella or multiple flagella. And this is that version. Flagellated cell. So then those can go through plasmogamy, um, which is the fusion of the cytoplasm, fertilization, and then we have this one larger, let's see if I can do a better job here, um, plasmodium. Uh, and then this, in this case, so we have put two amoeboid cells together or two flagellated cells together, and then when that happens, we end up with this large feeding plasmodium. Uh, so it's kind of multinucleate here. And then this multinucleated, it's a, a free-flowing mass that is going to kind of spread out um, in this way. So rather than it being a slug that actually physically moves from one location to another, instead, in this case, it's going to kind of spread out. Um, and we'll likely watch a video on that, or I'll post a video on that to watch so you can actually see the movement. It's going to spread out based on where it finds nutrients. So it'll actually start to kind of spread one of these arms, per se, in a direction, if it uh, runs out of nutrients or doesn't find any nutrients over here, then it'll just go back and it'll start to spread out an arm in another direction. Uh, and it'll just keep spreading and spreading and spreading until it finds nutrients and then it'll keep kind of moving, um, but it is not really moving, it's this protoplasm that's moving around. And then of course it can go back and it will form these sporangia and then more spores are produced, uh, et cetera. So those are the two different types of uh, slime molds that she did not cover in that lecture. So the cellular slime mold and the plasmodial slime mold, which you should be familiar with. Uh, then she did talk about uh, the chrome alveolata. She talked, she spoke about the api, uh, api complexins and, and kind of talked about several organisms there and the ciliates. Um, <clears throat> she did not talk about the omycetes, which are water molds. And so there's just a little bit in the text about them in chrome alveolata. So in chrome alveolata, the, at the very, very end, there are the omycetes. And as their name implies, mycete, um, meaning mold or fungi. So these are water molds. And then they are similar to fungi. And then they have cell walls that are made of cellulose uh, versus fungi. Remember, fungi have chitin. And then they are generally diploid, uh, whereas fungi are generally haploid. So similar to fungi has the term myke. Uh, in it or mycelium or whatever um, related to fungi, um, but slightly different. And then these are water molds. Uh, so then the next group, excavata, she did speak about excavata a bit. Um, in excavata, I think she didn't really elaborate excavata a bit on them, that these are um, primitive eukaryotes. So they have very limited metabolic abilities. <clears throat> so... Primitive, limited, metabolic capabilities or abilities. Um, but they do have, they're complex in shape and in structure. Uh, so there are a couple of subgroups here that you should be familiar with, which is fornicata. And these don't have any mitochondria. So recall that these have limited metabolic capabilities, and they're, they're so old, primitive, uh, that they don't have all of the same types of organelles that we normally see in a eukaryotic organism. Because remember, we're talking about eukaryotic organisms here. So uh, these fornicata don't have any mitochondria, but they have flagella. And an example 
is Giardia lamlia. And you should be familiar with Giardia lamlia. That's one of the um, organisms that cause disease that is important that we will talk about and go through in our eukaryotic organisms activity. So I wanted to mention that. And this is a diarrheal disease. <clears throat> so in Escovada, we have uh, Fornicata. We also have Parabacillia. So Parabacillia. And so these typically have animal symbionts. They have what are called basal bodies. So uh, frequent animal symbionts, which means that they live in the guts of animals like termites and cockroaches. They have basal bodies. <clears throat> They have comp complex cell structures, um, and they often have many flagella. So they are complex or have complex cell structures. They have flagella and uh, canidoplastids. And canidoplastids are like a modified type of mitochondria. So again, because they're primitive, they don't have the mitochondria um, that we're typically talking about, but they have this kind of modified version. And so an organism that you need to be familiar with from this group um, is Trichomonas vaginalis. So this is where we see the trichomonids. So for example, trichomonas... Vaginalis, uh, which again is in that activity. So the third subgroup of excavata are Euglenozoa. And Euglenozoa can be photosynthetic or not. Uh, photosynthetic or not. And then there are two types of genus, or two genus you should be familiar with in um, excavata, or uh, in euglenozoa. Um, euglena, as its name implies, which I think she may have spoken about a bit um, in the previous lecture, uh, but they're typically not pathogenic. Um, so they have a flagella and a pellicle and a stigma, uh, chloroplasts, because if they are photosynthetic, uh, but they are typically not uh, pathogenic. Now, the other group are the other genus. Here are the trypanosomes. And she did talk about the trypanosomes, so you should be familiar with that information as well as from our activities. So uh, we're talking about trypanosoma brucei. We're talking about trypanosomes. Panosoma cruci, uh, which is the African and the Chagas degrees, uh, disease, so African sleeping sickness and the Chagas disease. <clears throat> so these are both, as she mentions, um, from a trypanosoma. So then in the next section she talks about um, in 5.2, this is where we see the parasitic helminths. Parasitic helminths. And she does go into a bit of, t of detail about the parasitic helminths, um, a couple of different things that um, are, you know, a term here at the beginning that she didn't really go into is monoecious and dioecious. So I just wanted to go into that for just a moment. So monoecious means that they have both male and female reproductive organs. And she did talk about this with the flatworms later, but um, having both of those reproductive reproductive organs in that single organism. Uh, so monoecious is both male and female reproductive organs in one organism. And then dioecious is where they are either male or female. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, then she did talk about uh, nematoda and spoke about different types of organisms there. Remember nematoda are the roundworms. <clears throat> 
Uh, they're unsegmented. They're, you know, in the digestive tracts. And she talked about, or she spoke about Ascaris, Lumbricoides, and Pinworm. And um, you should be familiar with many of these from our activity. Then she spoke about Platyhelminthes. Platyhelminths or Platyhelminths. Um, and so these are the flatworms, and she spoke about the flukes and the tapeworms and the planarians. Um, so she did talk about the flukes, uh, the cestodes, the tapeworms. And then you should be familiar with the life cycle of a tapeworm. Um, so those terms that are associated with the tapeworms, like the scolex, for example, and the hooks and things like that, the proglottids that uh, attach and detach. And so you should be familiar with that. You should also be familiar with the life cycle of a tapeworm. So, for example... Um, the eggs or the gravid proglottes are in the feces, so eggs and feces, and then the to the cows or the pigs, cows or pigs ingest them, ingest eggs um, on plants, for example. They're eating the plants, and then the eggs are on there from previous feces. Um, then the oncospheres are going to hatch, so oncospheres are going to hatch and then they penetrate that intestinal wall and they circulate to the muscles so out of intestines into the muscles and then once they're in the muscles they develop into what are called cystocerci and then the cystocerci are going to be ingested by humans so humans are infected by eating undercooked meat. And then that scolex attaches to the intestines, to intestines. <clears throat> and then adults in the intestines are going to detach those proglottids, which are the eggs. So then they detach the proglottids creating more of them. So then from there, we move into 5.3. And in 5.3, uh, we have fungi. And she spoke very little about the fungi, so we're going to talk a bit about that. Um, she, did, she did talk about some of the structures and things like that. One thing that I'm not sure that she mentioned, um, but the term mycoses. Uh, mycoses are actually illnesses that are caused by fungi or illness caused by fungi. And as she mentioned, um, we do have illnesses that are caused by fungi, um, not quite as many as we see with some of the other things in this chapter, uh, especially because these are decomposers, and um, we do use them. So we use them for the production of cheese, for example. So for production of cheese, um, also as a source of antibiotics, source of antibiotics. <clears throat> Uh, she did go through the characteristics of fungi, so um, molds and how these are multicellular fungal bodies that are made up of hyphae, and then there's the thallus, which is the body, and then the mycelium is kind of this network of hyphae. One thing that she didn't really mention is the difference, I don't feel like, between septate hyphae and coenacidic hyphae. Um, so the septate hyphae. So septate hyphae just means that they have walls between the cells. <clears throat> so then they can break off. So they have walls between the cells and they're individual cells like this. Uh, and then they can break off and then move on. Um, so those are septate hyphae. Cholinocytic, cholino Cytic hyphae do not have those uh, cell walls. So there are no cell walls or cell membranes between the cells. <clears throat> um, and then there's a third image in the text, and I'll just mention that now because then she moved into speaking about yeasts and how those are unicellular fungi. Um, but yeast can make something called pseudohyphae. And pseudo, 
hyphae. As we know, pseudo means fake, and then hyphae. So it's it's a fake version of hyphae, which is where we actually see these individual, remember, um, yeasts are unicellular, so individual cells. And these individual cells will kind of clump up next to each other. And when they clump up next to each other, they actually end up making what looks sort of like hyphae. And so those are the pseudo hyphae. <clears throat> so a type of fungi, again, because we're talking about yeasts, which is a type of fungi, um, but different than the septate hyphae and the coenocytic hyphae or non-septate. This is also called non-septate hyphae. <clears throat> I also want to mention here that she did mention dimorphic fungi. Um, so that means that they have more than one appearance during their life cycle. And she just spoke about one of those where it can go back and forth between a yeast and a mold depending on the environment. So like the, the temperature, the different nutrients it's in. I did want to mention again that um, the cell walls in fungi are made of chitin versus cellulose, which is what we see in plants. Um, so that's the polysaccharide that is giving it structure. <clears throat> And then the cell membranes of fungi contain ergosterols. And this is important when we move into antibiotics in the future. So this is a key point that she didn't mention. Um, so chitin is what the cell walls are made of. And then <clears throat> their cell membranes contain ergosterols. So this is instead of cholesterol. So recall that we have cholesterol, animals have cholesterol in the plasma membranes. They're kind of like the rocks that make thing a little bit, everything a little bit more fluid because they have to move around them. Um, and instead of having cholesterol, the cell membranes of fungi have ergosterols. And that's an important distinction between our eukaryotic cells that have cholesterol and the eukaryotic cells of fungi that have ergosterols because that's one way that we can um, <clears throat> create some sort of pharmaceutical to get rid of fungi if we have a fungal infection, that if we get rid of something or some part of production of ergosterols or attack the ergosterols themselves, then we can attack their structures and not our own structures. All right, so then we have the life cycle of fungi. <clears throat> and she did speak a bit about this because she spoke about histoplasma capsulatum. Um, so recall that fungi can reproduce uh, sexually by cross or by cross or self fertilization. Uh, so this is life cycle here. And so recall that in the first step we have these haploid fungi that form hyphae with gametes at the tips of them. So the, those are called the zygomycetes. Uh, zygo. Mycete is the gamete at the tips of the hyphae. And so these are um, haploid fungi that form these gametes. And then the gametes have two different mating types. So there's the positive and the minus mating types. So a positive and a, mit a negative mating type. Then the second step is plasmogamy. 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 In plasmogamy, this is when we have the fusion of that positive and negative cytoplasm, and that produces, so the positive and the negative come together, uh, this fusion. And then when this happens, we have a dikaryotic cell. Dikaryotic cell, which means that it has two nuclei. And then those two nuclei eventually come together. Um, at this point, it's called a zygosporangium. Then these two come together, and that is in karyogamy. So that's the fusion of nuclei. So we have the, the fusion of these gametes first. That's then a dikaryotic cell. Um, that has two nuclei. Then the, we have karyogamy, which is the fusion of the nuclei to form a diploid zygote. Then in the fourth step, we have meiosis and germination. So the zygote forms this 
stock and the spores are in haploid form. And then of course we go back to the beginning here because we've created these spores up here and then we have the positive and the negative and then those confused become that dikaryotic cell, etc. Um, <clears throat> or we can have asexual reproduction of fungi. So asexual reproduction. And in asexual reproduction, this can be mitosis. This can be mitosis with budding. It can be fragmentation with the hyphae. Um, or they can form asexual spores. Um, so mitosis, and I believe she mentioned this, mitosis with budding, fragmentation. We spoke about budding and fragmentation at the beginning of the semester. And then they can form asexual spores. So those are different ways of asexual produ uh, production, reproduction of fungi. Um, so then there is the fungal diversity, and I believe she spoke a bit about this, um, but not too much. So we're going to go into a little bit of that. So we'll say fungal diversity. So there are seven main groups. Uh, the first one is uridinomycetes. And these are the plant rusts, and these are typically red. The second are the eustilago mycetes, and these are plant smuts, and these are usually dark in color. The third are the glomeromycota, or mycota. And these are obligate symbionts. Symbiont, which means that they can only survive when they are associated with plant roots. So they cannot live on their own. Um, so they work in relationship with the plants. <clears throat> so they receive carbohydrates from the plants and the plant um, in benefits from the increased ability to get nutrients and things from the soil. The next group are the zygomycota, or mycota, or the zygomycetes. Zygomycetes. Um, in this, these are mainly saprophytes and coenocytic hyphae um, and have haploid nuclei. So these use sporangiospores uh, to reproduce asexually, and they use zygospores to produce sexually. Um, and we use these, we see zygomycota in food science, and we see them as crop pathogens. So they are worth mentioning. So I will write that down. So uh, saprophytes with coenocytic hyphae. Uh, they have sporangiospores. For asexual reproduction, they use zygospores sexually. And then we see these in food science. So we see them because they are bread molds. We see these in bread molds. Um, so in food science, whoops. And we see them as crop pathogens. So that same one that causes bread molds can also cause rice seedling blight, um, which, as its name implies, rice seedlings is part of a crop, and that's pathogenic to the crop. So um, it can ruin that. And then we can also see some causing some infections in humans, um, <clears throat> but not much detail there because that doesn't happen all that often. The next group are the ascomycota. And some of these are edible. Some spoil food. So some spoil food. Uh, some are plant and human pathogens. Um, 
these may have septate hyphae. <clears throat> so septate hyphae and ascocarps. And ascocarps are cup-shaped fruiting bodies. So cup-shaped fruiting bodies. So similar to the fruiting bodies that we spoke about earlier, um, but instead they're sh they're cup shaped rather than um, kind of all in within a capsule. Uh, some use ascospores, which are sexually produced spores. Some use conidia which are asexual spores, and some use ascus, which are ascospores in an ascocarp. So ascospores, those sexually produced spores in an ascocarp, which is the cup-shaped fruiting bodies. Um, here what we see is something that's important to us called an aflatoxin. Um, so aflatoxin is a chemical that's produced by aspergillus, and that is a toxin and a carcinogen. So um, and that is an important species in this genus, <clears throat> or this is, that is an important genus within this uh, main group of fungus because they can cause allergy, they can cause infection. Um, so it can be very dangerous to use or to get an infection with aspergillus. Um, it also contaminates stored grains and nuts, um, which can then be toxic to humans. Um, but it also is used, as long as it's used well, it's used um, in fermented foods and fermented beverages. Um, for example, the text mentions in sake is what they use as aspergillus. So, um, but aspergillus can cause this or can create this aflatoxin, and it is the most potent known natural carcinogen, so it's quite dangerous. So a chemical produced by aspergillus. <clears throat> so it's a toxin and a carcinogen. So again, the most dangerous one. Uh, natural, most dangerous, m most toxic, natural carcinogen. The next group is called Basidiomycota, or mycota, Basidiomycota. And Basidiomycota are the fungi that have basidia, uh, which are club-shaped structures. These club-shaped club structures then contain and pr have produced basidiospores. Um, so then these spores are produced um, via budding or released via budding and that's from what are called basidiocarps. So these are fungi with basidia, which are the club-shaped structures. And then these basidia contain or produce basidiospores. These are spores via budding. And then these are in basidiocarps, which are the fruiting bodies. And the basidiomycota are important decomposers in food. So decomposers in food. <clears throat> Good. The next group are the microsporidia. Microsporidia. Uh, these are unicellular, unicellular fungi. They are obligate intracellular parasite parasites. Obligate These cells lack a mitochondria and peroxisomes and centrioles, but even though they lack those things, they create what's called a polar tubule. So they lack mitochondria, 
proxosomes, centrioles. But what they do is they create a polar tubule. And this polar tubule um, is going to pierce the host cell membrane. Um, so they, <clears throat> excuse me, so they can gain entry because again, they're obligate intracellular parasites, uh, meaning they have to be inside of the cell. So they pierce the cell membrane. That's the host cell membrane. <clears throat> Good. So the ascomycetes tend to be the most medically important. Um, and she did speak a bit about the ascomycete um, that was you know, interesting because of the bats and, and remodeling homes and things like that. Um, so you should know that one, but you should know the ones, again, from our Chapter 5 uh, activity. So the last uh, portion of this, or not the last portion, but the second to last portion, the 4.5, is algae. And she did a good job of going through the different types of algae. Um, so I think that I will leave that as it is. She went through a lot of different definitions, the different types. Um, what makes them the different types, however, I don't think she mentioned that, are the different types of um, pigments within them. So recall that um, algae are photosynthetic. And so they have different types of pigments within them. Um, some of them are going to give them their red color, like uh, red algae has rhodophyta, or is rhodophyta, and it has um, rhodopsin in it. And then the green algae has chlorophyll in it. So we have these different types of pigments within the chloroplasts that are going to be going through um, photosynthesis. And so we have the different colors based on that. That's not exactly... Um, all that has to do with the different colors, but that's just something that she didn't mention, or utilizing those different pigments. So then the last section are the lichens, and she didn't mention the lichens at all. So we are going to talk about them here. So a lichen is a combination of two different organisms. So a combination of two different organisms. The two different organisms are either green algae and or with an ascomycete fungi or a cyanobacterium with an isco, ascomycete fungi. And these organisms are living in a symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic relationship. Um, <clears throat> so this is a type of symbiotic relationship that's called controlled parasitism. Um, controlled parasitism. And that, whoops, and that is because <clears throat> the fungus actually is going to get photosynthates, um, so things from photosynthesis, from the algae or the cyanobacterium. And then the algae is able to grow in drier environments than it normally would because of the fungus. But the algae or the cyanobacteria does not grow as well um, with the fungus if it were to be without the fungus. So that's why it's controlled parasitism. Remember, parasitism is when one organism benefits and the other one is harmed. Um, so in this case, the fungi gets those photosynthates um, from the algae. So algae or cyanobacteria. <clears throat> And then the algae or cyanobacteria can grow in a more diverse environment. So it can grow in, I'll just say a drier environment because remember that algae or uh, cyanobacteria are typically in water or aquatic environments or something that's very, very moist. Um, but fungi is not, so that can be found on pretty much anywhere. But... So, but the algae or the cyanobacteria grows less well in this environment or with the fungi. So, grows less well with the fungi versus if it were on its own. So, that's why it's controlled parasitism. 
Now, these lichens are very important in our ecosystem um, because they break down rock. So they break down, they're one of the earliest colonizers um, of a soil-less environment. So they were ones that were here, you know, way back, and they broke down rock, and they started to create the soil for other organisms to grow, like plants. Um, so then they are also soil stabilizers. They are food. So if you um, recall seeing lichens, a lot of times you see them growing on rocks, you see them growing on trees, and so then they can be food for other organisms um, that come along, especially in the wintertime, because lichens can grow um, and kind of hang out for generations. I think it even said in the text for decades um, or something uh, even longer than that. Um, so they can hang out for a very, very long time. And that is important for organisms that need food in the winter. So I think the text uses the example of caribou, um, using that as food. And these are epiphytes, or can be epiphytes. And that means that they can grow on other plants. <clears throat> All right. So let's take a quick look at the three different types of lichens and then the structure of a lichen. So there are three main morphologies or growth forms. So there are what are called crustose lichens. And these are tightly attached to the substrate, so these look crusty, which is why the name is crustose. Um, so they are crusty, tightly attached to the substrate. So these are the ones that you would typically see, or I think of often seeing on rocks, where it's like this really hard substance, this really hard kind of green coloring um, that looks like what I would think of algae, um, but it's not just algae, it's actually a lichen, because of course algae wouldn't be living in that dry, dry environment on top of a rock, and it looks like you can just kind of scrape it off and it's going to flake off. Uh, the second one is folios lichen, or lichens. And these, like folios or foliage, they look like leaves. <clears throat> so they have leaf-like lobes, and they um, can attach at one area. And then this one actually has a slightly different structure that we'll talk about in a moment, but it has a second cortex that's below the medulla region. But um, for right now, we'll just say leaf-like lobes. So these are kind of, uh, let's see, so the crustose is like a rock. And it just basically looks like, basically just on the rock. Um, when you think of a folios lichen, I kind of think of a tree. And then we have it kind of coming off of the tree in this way. <clears throat> Maybe since this is not very three-dimensional, that doesn't make much of a difference. But uh, three, we have our fruticose lichens. And fruticose lichens have this branched appearance. They look more like a bush on something. So they are rounded, and then they have an overall branched appearance. So in this case, if we had a similar tree, in this case it actually looks like kind of like a bush that's growing on the tree. And these are all different kind of branches that are coming off of it. Um, more than this, which has a lot of kind of base attachment here, I would call it. Um, not technically, though. And then we have this more like leaf-like, bush-like, fruticose <coughs> lichen. So we have the three different types of lichens <coughs> and those three different kind of growth forms. And now let's just take a quick look at the lichen structure. So if we take a look at the lichen structure that actually attached to their substrate, whatever it is at the bottom, um, with what are called rhizines. So this is the anchor. <clears throat> and the body of the lichen is called the phallus. So that should be a tim uh, familiar term now. So this is the body of the lichen. So the thallus 
is going to be anchored through these risings. Uh, anchors phallus to substrate. So then, as I mentioned, folios lichens have this uh, secondary or lower cortex. This is where we would find the lower cortex, which is a more tightly packed area. Uh, tightly packed fungi. So this is where we would have the lower cortex here, and that's in folios lichens. Then as we move uh, more superficially, so this is our cortex, our lower cortex, then we have the medulla. Medulla means middle, medulla. Um, and then this is more loosely packed fungus. So kind of more loosely packed fungus here. Then as we move up, then we have our algal zone. So this is where we have our algae that's mixed in with the fungus, but more algae here than fungus. Uh, so this is our algal zone. So this is where our photosynthesis occurs. And then we get up to the top here, and this is where we have our cortex, or our outer cortex, if we're talking about folios. Um, if we're talking about our crustose or our, our fruticose, though, then we're just saying the cortex because it's the only one that there is. So again, this is tightly packed fungi. And that's why I drew it like that, because it's more tightly packed. <clears throat> and this is, of course, fungi strands that are stuck to um, or attached to anchoring that phallus, the entire body. Um, so this is the structure that we see. This whole thing then here is going to be the phallus. This is a structure that we see in all of these three different types of morphologies. It's just we see them obviously in different ways. So if we were talking about the crustos lichen, all of these things would be you know, something very, very small like this on top of the rock uh, versus folios. Then we would see that extend out and we would have our layers in this way. Um, so this is the similar lichen structure. And of course, remember then we would also include our lower cortex in that case. So um, that wraps up our chapter five. <clears throat> so be sure that you have listened to both my lecture and the other instructor's lecture um, to cover all of the information in chapter five. But then also you should be completing or will be completing, depending on when you listen to this, um, an activity based on the chapter five organisms. And those are the organisms you do not have to copy down all of the tables in chapter five and know all of the information in the tables in chapter five. What you do need to know are the details in the chapter five activity um, that you will be provided with. Um, so all of the organisms and everything listed in that activity, which uh, you should understand once you have that activity if you don't already have it.